Hello, welcome to the lecture for Math 1325 for Section 11.5, Applications in Business and Economics. Today we're going to look at some specific um, problems using the skills that we've learned and the special derivatives. We're first going to look at a, the concepts of price and demand and how these concepts are related. These are very intuitive and um, so it should be an easy concept to grasp. We all know what the price of an item is. This is the cost to buy something. We do this all the time, whether it's a grocery store, in the mall, etc. The concept of demand is the number of people who want to buy an item. So if demand is high, that means a lot of people want it. For example, an iPhone. Lots of people want iPhones, and when the new one comes out, we see them sleeping out, etc. If demand is low, for example, renting videos from blockbusters, um, then usually those kind of businesses either have to change or go out of business. Okay, What we're going to look at is how these things are related, and this is very intuitive. In general, as the price for an item increases, the demand decreases, and vice versa. For example, as the price of an iPhone goes down, more people will likely want one. Let's think about that. So let's say an iPhone now costs $1,000 for the new iPhone 17. If we drop that iPhone cost down, to let's say half of that to $500, then a lot more people are probably going to want it because it becomes more affordable. This is very intuitive, um, and we can even look the opposite way, right? Like if an iPhone 17, um, they start out selling it at 500, but they realize lots of people want them, they might jack the price up to 1,000 um, to make more money, even though fewer people will buy them. When demand changes considerably or a lot with price, as the price goes down, demand goes up, as the price goes up, demand goes down, we call this an elastic demand because the demand is stretchy, it changes. You know, an elastic is a rubbery qu uh, qu uh, quality. Okay, so that makes sense, right? We can get that. But in some cases, we have what we call inelastic demand, and this is where the demand really doesn't change as the price changes. Now, this one is a little bit more of a stretch, and we have to think through. Why would that occur, and when would that occur? Well, look at this icon over here of a, of, a, of a needle. Think about it. Imagine you had diabetes, and you needed insulin. Now, it, it really doesn't matter how much that insulin costs because it's a life-or-death situation, and you need the medicine. It's not that you want it, like the iPhone, but you need it. So in this case, medicine is often a good example of inelastic demand. So the demand doesn't change much as the price changes because it's something you need beyond uh, the qualification of price. So um, price, demand, and elasticity. So economists have created a formula that allows us to quantify how elastic a, uh, the demand of a product is. And um, this uh, this is a Greek letter, a lowercase n. I'm not sure the name of it, but it's a Greek letter that which stands for elasticity. And the elasticity equals the quantifier equals the opposite or negative of the price p over the quantity q times the derivative of the quantity with respect to the price dq dp we might also call this q prime from our prior notation so let's look at a quick example and you'll see how this works so here we have the elasticity uh, I'm sorry, we have a demand function, P plus 5Q. Again, remember, P is price, Q is quantity equals 100. It's asking us to find the elasticity, we're going to use this formula, when the price is 40, when the price is 60, when the price is 50. Okay, so let's first find the derivative of the quantity with respect to price. Now, notice that our equation here is not an explicit equation, it's implicit, but it's a pretty simple equation. If we solve this equation for Q, then we'll define Q in terms of P, and then we can just take the derivative of that, and that makes it pretty easy. So let's look at that first. So if we solve this equation for Q, P plus 5Q equals 100, we get Q equals 20 minus 1 fifth P. If we take the derivative of this with respect to P, notice we just get the answer dp, or excuse me, dq dp equals negative 1 fifth. Very straightforward, you should be able to solve that. 
So now we need the other two pieces, the price and the quantity. We have the price given to us in all three questions, and we need to figure out the quantity. Well, we have an equation which relates the two of them, so let's put the price in and figure out the quantity for each of them. Put in P, which in the first example is 40, and then figure out Q. So Q at 40 equals 12. When we put P is 40, we get 40 plus 5Q equals 100, or we can use this equation, 20 minus 1 5th P, 40 over 5 equals 12. So here's our Q for the first for problem A. We then plug all those values in. The elasticity equals negative P over Q times DQ DP, and we get an elasticity of 2 thirds. When we plug in Q, when we plug in the price of 60, we get Q equals 8. Again, we plug these into the elasticity formula, negative P over Q times DQ DP. In this case, the, the derivative is a constant, negative one-fifth. And in this case, in problem B, we get the elasticity is three halves. For the last problem, when we plug in a price of 50, we get Q equals 10. Plugging all those values in, negative P 50 over Q 10 times dq dp negative one-fifth, we get equals one. So these are our three values. I've walked through that pretty quickly, but it's just um, finding each of these pieces. Typically, we find the derivative first and then find our quantities of p or q. In the problem we just did, we found the elasticity to be two-thirds when the price was 40, three-halves when the price was 60, and one when the price was 50. Okay, here's, an, uh, here's our demand function, and we can see that before, um, what is that, before the quantity of 10, or before this point, 1050 quantity price, um, the elasticity is greater than 1. After um, this, this equilibrium point, um, the elasticity is less than 1, okay? Be careful here, because a lot of what we've been doing, we've been thinking of uh, these formulas in relation to derivatives. And although the elasticity uses a derivative in its equation, it is not the derivative. It is not the slope of the demand function. So be very mindful of that. Okay, What elasticity measures is the responsiveness of consumers to changes in price, okay? The responsiveness of consumers to changes in price. So remember our derivative is some rate of change and we're looking at potentially uh, the rate of change of quantity as it relates to price. But then it's kind of measuring this idea about how the consumers will respond to that, okay? If the elasticity number is greater than one, we say that the demand is elastic. And this means um, that the percent decrease in demand is greater than the corresponding percent increase in price. If the elasticity is less than one, we say the demand is inelastic. And if the, in, if the elasticity is equal to one, we call this um, unitary elastic demand. This is also the kind of the optimum place. This is where you want to be if you're trying to set a price, okay? So that as your price goes up, demand goes down and vice versa. So let's look at a more complicated problem, one where we're going to have to use implicit differentiation to solve, but we're going to solve it in a similar way. So we have the demand for a, a, a certain product here. Um, and again, we have the price equals um, a function of Q. The price is, in, uh, is the price per unit in dollars, and the Q is in demand in units. Find the elasticity of demand with respect to price when Q equals 19. Okay, so we already have one of our variables, Q. We need to find P, which we can easily do by plugging 19 into this equation. And we need to find the derivative of Q with respect to P. Now, this is not an equation that's going to be easy to solve for Q. So this is one that it's actually easier to solve using implicit differentiation. Okay, so let's go that, through that first part. So here I first just rewritten this equation as P equals 1,000 times Q plus 1 to the negative 2. So I just got rid of the fraction so I don't have to take, um, don't have to use the quotient um, for doing the derivative. Remember that when we do 
implicit differentiation, we differentiate both sides with, this, with respect to the same variable. Since we're looking for dq dp, I'm going to take the derivative with respect to p on both sides. On the left side, the derivative with respect to p of just p is going to be 1, right? Just like if I had d dx of x, that would be 1. On the right here, I have a chain rule. I don't have the variable p, so I have to remember that this is the implicit part, okay? So on the left, I had 1. On the right, I'd have, remember, I bring that um, exponent down, so I'd have negative, because it's negative 2 times 1,000, or negative 2,000, times the quantity inside, q plus 1. Remember, I subtract 1 from the exponent, so this would be q plus 1 to the negative 3, which moves it into the denominator. And then remember, I add a q prime or a dq b dp because this is not the variable we're doing. That's part of that chain rule, part of implicit differentiation, which we used before. Then I solve this equation for dq dp, which means that I just simply multiply by the reciprocal here, um, negative q plus 1 cubed over 2,000. And that's what I get for the derivative with respect to p. Now I want to find the elasticity specifically when q equals 19, so I'm going to plug that into both equations. I'm going to plug it into the original equation to find my value of p, and I'm going to plug it into this derivative that we found to find my value of q prime. I'm not going to walk through these. These are straight arithmetic, just plugging in values. So I get p equals 5 halves, or $2.50 perhaps, because it's the unit price per unit in dollars, and dq dp equals negative 4. With these, all these values, now all I have to do is plug them in and solve. So remember, um, elasticity equals negative p, which is negative 5 halves, over q, 19, times dq dp, which is negative 4. And when I do this, I get um, the value 10 19 Now, is that an elastic demand or inelastic? Remember, elastic demands are when the, this measurement is greater than 1. Since the numerator is less than the denominator, this is less than 1, so our demand is inelastic. This means that as our price changes, the demand does not change very much. <clears throat> now, revenue and elasticity are related in a special way, and you can go through this. I'm not going to walk through this proof of, of how we do it. This is just taking the idea of revenue, which equals the price of an item times the quantity. We know that if I buy, if an apple costs a dollar and I buy five of them, the money that I'm going to spend is five times a dollar or five dollars. That's a simple intuitive equation for revenue. And then taking the derivative and then doing some substitutions here so that we get to this final formula. And so this is saying that the way that the revenue changes with respect to price is equal to the quantity times 1 minus the elasticity, okay? So notice what this means, that if the elasticity is greater than 1, my revenue is going to go down. If the elasticity is greater than 1, then the then the um, the revenue is going to go down because this is going to be 1 minus a negative 1, okay? Now, of course, this is depending upon how the price is changing. So if the price increases, the revenue decreases. If the price decreases, the revenue increases. And so the elasticity here, uh, when a system, when the demand is elastic, we have kind of what we call an, an opposite or inverted relationship, okay? If the function is inelastic, if the price increases, revenue increases, inelastic systems have a direct relationship so that if price increases, revenue increases, okay? And then unitary elastic um, means that uh, this would be zero because remember that the elasticity would be one, so one minus one is zero. So an increase or decrease in price will not change the revenue. And that's why we say that this is where we optimize. Revenue is optimized at unitary elasticity. So let's see how that works. We have another problem here where the demand for a product, P equals 10 times the square root of 100 minus Q. And instead of a value for Q, we have a range. So we're trying to figure out what's going on with this, trying to identify the different types of elasticity, where it's unitary, where it's inelastic, and where it's elastic. And then we want to find Q where the revenue is increasing and where it's decreasing, okay? 
So let's look at this. So let's just start finding our parts like we did before. Here again, I've rewritten this into an exponential. I'm not going to solve for Q first. I'm just going to take the implicit derivative. I'm not going to go through this. You should know how to do this. Again, the derivative of P is 1. Bring down the exponent. Subtract 1 from the exponent. Then take the derivative of inside, which is negative 1, etc. And we get this formula um, for the derivative of Q with respect to P. Okay. So this is now asking us to find um, the point at which the demand is of unitary elasticity. So what we're going to do here is we're going to set uh, the elasticity equal to 1 and then solve this equation. Okay, So we're just plugging in the part. Remember we have a formula for P in terms of Q. So that's what I'm going to substitute in the formula for P. That's going to be over Q and then times the derivative of Q with respect to P. And now I just simplify this. And what I get is that the elasticity will equal 1 when, um, with the formula 200 minus 2Q over Q. I'm sorry, this is the elasticity. Now I need to set that equal to 1, my bad, um, and then solve. Here I'm going to cross multiply, and so I get Q equals 200 minus 2Q. And when I solve for this, I get the quantity equals 66 and 2 thirds. Now it asks me to find the point at which this demand is of unitary elasticity, so I need to plug this back into my original equation for P and solve that. And when I do that, I get uh, the price is $57.74. So this is my point. Remember, we're thinking of this in terms of a graph, um, Q being the X value and P being the Y value, if you will. So let's move on and find the other points. Okay, We, we found unitary elasticity. We also want to find um, the intervals in which the demand is inelastic. So here we can do the same thing. We set, remember this is the equation we got for elasticity in terms of Q. Inelastic is when it's less than 1. And so we do the same thing. So it's, the, system, the demand is inelastic when Q is greater than 66 and 2 thirds. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's elastic when, um, remember the elasticity is greater than 1, so we solve that and we get Q is less than 66 and 2 thirds. Okay. Remember that um, revenue increases when demand is elastic, so we get revenue increases between 0 and 66 and decreases when the demand is inelastic between 66 and 1000. Now why is that? Let's look at the graph and that may help us see it a little bit better. Revenue is always maximized at unitary elasticity. Okay, so remember <clears throat> from zero, um, we have an elastic system here. And as price, remember for elastic systems, for elastic systems, um, the demand and the and the revenue are opposite functions. Okay, so as the price increases, the revenue is going to decrease for elastic systems. As the revenue increases, the price is going to decrease. Okay? And then as the price drops off here, I'm sorry, this is the revenue function. Yeah. So as the revenue it's going the revenue is going to increase. And then the revenue will decrease as the price decreases after 66 and 2 thirds. And we can see this revenue function just by multiplying this by Q. And we can see it here and we can see that that maximum is reached there. So a good way to test this theory out is also just to graph the revenue function um, from your demand function. Remember um, revenue equals uh, price times demand. And you can see that it's increasing until we get to that 66 point and then it's decreasing afterward. This last slide is on uh, maximizing tax revenue. Um, I encourage you, especially if you're looking at being an accountant, to kind of read through that section in the chapter. But this is a, a very stringent process. It's very um, something you would do time and time again, um, following steps. I am not going to test you on this. And in fact, I've even removed those homework problems from um, the homework online. So you don't, you are not responsible for this material. But again, if you're planning on studying accounting, I would definitely read through that section and understand how this works. Um, it's, it's again a demand and a supply and demand idea, and it's about maximizing um, tax revenue and hidden taxes. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. If you're interested in this, go to the online text, and um, we'll move to the next lecture.